The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the webinar today. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, working with you. Um, I apologise for the change of time. Um, I'm up in Weber, and uh, and as a result of that, I've had to change the time. So rather than lunch and learn, it might be breakfast and learn. But never mind. Uh, welcome anyway. And of course, if people miss this broadcast, I'll be sending you out an email this afternoon, which will give you a chance to uh, to review. So just in the question box, I just want to make sure that the internet's working effectively. Could you just type in a word like clear in the question box just to let me know that um, I'm coming across loud and clear. Thank you, Desiree. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you, John. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Right, it looks like I am coming through loud and clear, which is wonderful. Now, just while you're in that question box, um, if you've got questions during the presentation, the normal procedure, just type in a question and I will uh, respond to it as soon as I see it on my screen. So uh, that would be fantastic if you could do that. Uh, that way we won't have that awkward silence at the 10 minute before the end mark where people are worrying and thinking about their questions. So just type it in as we go and that would be working really, really well. All right, so let's get underway and let's, um, let's uh, start the process. Now, so far, what we've done is we have got down to halfway point where we've completed three modules. So we've done the ingredients of feedback and effective feedback, and I'm hoping you're still applying those, those uh, tips and hints. And essentially what that means is giving three bits of feedback every day. Bear in mind, of course, there is, there's positive feedback and negative feedback, and I'm suggesting to you that you balance that up and not just give negative feedback. In module two, um, as you'll be aware, we looked at the influencing capabilities profile, and in that profile, it gave you an opportunity to understand your preferred influencing strategy. So we had investigation, calculation, which are both logical forms of influence, and then we had motivation and collaboration, which are more emotional approaches to influence. And what the point about module two was, was that you should be trying different approaches in different situations and with different people. So I hope you've had a chance to have some fun with that. And I guess what I want you to do is to vary your influencing style depending on the circumstances or the individual that you are influencing and not just sticking to your favorite strategy. Because if you do that, you're likely to be not as influential as you possibly could be. And two weeks ago, we went through module three, which was around the optimizing team performance. And essentially, my key point there was that you should be entering into conversations on a regular basis with your team. And I hope you've been able to implement that. Those of you that do have a team, or certainly in the future when you do have a team, that you get into that habit of having that fortnightly catch up and really communicating on a human level with people, because ultimately that's what organisations are, is a bunch of people working towards a common cause. So that's got where we've got to so far in the program. And today we're going through getting the very best from people, which is always an elusive topic. And the law of averages is probably that you've got one or two people who you just don't quite know how to get the best out of them. It's just a ongoing struggle, and I'm hoping that I might be able to give you some insights this morning that might be able to help you think about those sorts of things differently. And I'll share with you some uh, very reputable motivational theory and talk a little bit about how you might apply that in a very practical sense. Um, and I'll just brief you on modules five and six towards the end of the presentation. Suffice to say that in module five, you'll be required to complete your second diagnostic, which will be, an, which will be a personality profile, 
and uh, that'll be a paper version and I'll be sending that out to you today and I'd ask you to complete that so that when we're sitting in module five it's more a debrief than anything else. All right so that's pretty much where we're at if you've got any questions or comments or statements or whatever you might like you know to type into the question box over on the right hand side. Now I would argue that your primary role, and I say primary advisedly, your primary role as a leader is to get the very best from each of the team members that you're leading. Now, that might seem like a daunting task, particularly if you've got high standards of yourself and you don't believe that people are meeting your standards. But when I say the very best, I don't necessarily mean at 100% optimal productivity I'm really talking at maybe a 10% increase. Uh, you know, if you get a 10% increase and you've got five people in your team, for example, you have a 50% overall increase in productivity, arguably, and exponentially that'll make a huge difference in your workplace. So I'm not suggesting you should drop your standards. I'm just simply being suggesting to you to be realistic that if people are working at 60% in your mind, getting them to 70 is an achievement. If someone's working at 80%, getting them to a 90% productivity level is an achievement. Uh, having someone at 30%, getting them to a 40% productivity is an achievement. So hopefully I can give you some ways and means of doing that today, which you might find hopefully useful and practical. And the homework for you, of course, is to try some of these approaches as soon as you finish this broadcast today. All right, so what are we covering today? Okay, basically there are a number of things that we're covering. Um, we are going to look at some of the myths around motivation. There's a lot of misinformation about how we get the very best out of people and I wanted to demystify that today and talk a little bit about why those myths are myths and what you might be able to do in return. Um, I would like to look at some reputable information about what people want out of their job because it's very useful to know. And I am going to share with you some research of 9,000 employees across four continents, across 21 industries, and actually look at the aggregate of what they actually want from their job. And we can use that as a benchmark and say, okay, are we ticking all those boxes as leaders? Are we doing all of these things or could we be doing some other things more effectively? And uh, I want to talk uh, thirdly about job and non-job tasks. Now, job tasks, of course, are the technical requirements of what people do in their job. Essentially, that's covered in the job description, but there is another set of tasks called the non-job tasks. And these tasks are often underrated and they are still very important in terms of people's productivity. So for example, being a team player is a very important part of someone's uh, productivity and they themselves, um, maybe it's not listed on their job description, but nevertheless, it's critically important when people do their work. So we'll look at the non-job tasks and what I'm going to share with you is four non-job tasks that I believe that you can pay more attention to, which is another way of increasing performance, but to do it in a way that's not specific to the job description. So that's what we're covering during the next 40 or so minutes. So very shortly, um, here we are, it's on your screen now. What I want to talk about now is, well, what actually is motivation? Because let's be clear about what we mean by motivation. A lot of people have varying ideas about what motivation is. And I think I'd like to just define that with you. And what you're seeing on your screen in the middle there in the circle is um, a definition that I like in relation to motivation. So let's cover that and then let's unpack it and actually look at the different dimensions of motivation. There are three dimensions, which are those spokes coming from the definition. 
So in my mind, motivation is the forces within an individual that account for the level, direction and per persistence of effort expended at work. So there's a couple of key words there that I've highlighted. Forces within. So really motivation is an inside job. At the end of the day, it's the individual who ultimately makes the decision to become motivated. There are certain things that you as a leader can do and should do to create an environment where people become motivated, but ultimately it's the individual's decision. And some will and some won't, and that's just life. And then there are three dimensions. There is the level of effort, there's the direction of the effort, and there's the persistence of the effort, which are critically important. So let's take direction first. So what we mean by direction is it's a person's choice about where when presented with a number of alternatives. So this is about people's priorities. So are people working on the right thing at the right time in the right way? Ultimately, that's what direction's about. So we want people focused on their core responsibilities. So that is an element of motivation. So people can be actually be putting in quite a lot of discretionary effort, but working on the wrong things. So it's important that we make sure that people are very clear about what they, they are expected to do in their job. It's important that we let people know what deadlines are. It's important that we let people know what to concentrate on at the time. And this is particularly important in our busy world because everybody is busy, everybody is flat strapped, and as a result of that, people often lose direction. And so as a leader, we need to continually remind people one-on-one -on -one and in groups of what the important direction is. So that's obviously one important dimension of motivation, where people are expending their energies, which is the direction. Another area, of course, on the right-hand side is persistence, and that's how long a person sticks at a given action. So obviously we want people to uh, persevere, we want people to put in effort over a period of time. So it's not unusual, of course, for people to try something such as going to the gym and starting an exercise program and they don't persevere, they're not persistent, and after two or three particular workouts, being very sore and feeling sorry for themselves, decide that this isn't for them. Well, according to this definition, they're not ticking that box of persistence. So it is very, very important for uh, people to stick at that. Now that requires you, I think, to have encouraging conversations with people, to uh, give people some, uh, the resources that they need to do the job, to remove some of the barriers that are, that, are, that are getting in the way of doing the job, and again, to create an environment where people are willing to be persistent. Now, the third element of motivation is the level of intensity, which we call level. So that's the intensity of effort that people put forth. So we want people, obviously, to not just go about things in a very half-hearted way. We want people to give full intensity to the work that they're doing. And if people are doing things very slowly, they're not meeting deadlines, they're not achieving milestones, they're short on their KPIs, it's probably because <clears throat> their level of intensity is not where it needs to be. So it's really important for a leader to give people some clarity around what their expectations are in relation to the intensity that people should be putting into the job, if that makes sense. So I would ask you to Consider motivation on three levels. What choices are people making in relation to where they spend their time? How persistent are they on the tasks that are required to be done? And how intense is the effort they're putting in to achieve those tasks? So this is important because when you look at someone and if you said to, you said to me, well, that person over there is very motivated, well, that person over there is not motivated, they're demotivated. A better question then would be to follow up with, well, what is it about their, what is it about their motivation that's lacking? Is it their direction? 
Is it their persistence or is it the level of intensity that they're putting into the work that they're required to do? And if you can ask that intelligent question, then it leads you to implement a course of action that's likely to arrest that dimension and perhaps improve their performance. Um, so that's motivation. It's important that we know, <coughs> excuse me, it's important that we know what motivates people. Now what I'd like to do is just talk about some of the myths around motivation. And as I said at the outset, there are lots of misleading information about motivation and I think it's important that we understand what some of that misleading information is and what you might do uh, with that information. So one of the, one of the uh, mis misleading elements of motivation is this. You can't actually motivate people. You can only provide the circumstances by which people become motivated. Because as I said at the outset, it's people's choice about whether they become motivated. So it's important that we understand this. And I do recall when I was managing in the corporate world that I honestly believed that I could motivate people. And uh, after a while, I realized that's not in fact the case. It is people themselves that make the choice. And in fact, what that means is that no matter what you do, people will still make a choice. Some people will be motivated no matter what you do, and other people will perhaps be demotivated no matter what you do. Now that's quite liberating when you think, think about it because that means that our role as leaders is really to create the right circumstances, the right circumstances, the platform, the environment, and then people will make that decision, hopefully, to be motivated, but ultimately it's their decision. All right, so it's very important that we understand that it's an inside job. It's people's role to be motivated. It's our role as leaders to create the right climate for people to be motivated. So that's one of the myths. Another myth is that people, or that everyone is motivated, uh, but not everyone is inspired. Now, this is true. Just getting out of bed this morning did require a level of motivation, or, albeit perhaps not a great level of motivation, but nevertheless, people got out of bed this morning uh, because they were motivated to do so. So the truth of the matter is we can't really typecast people and say that that person is naturally motivated and that person isn't. We're all motivated on some things in some ways, but that doesn't mean we're necessarily inspired. And what happens in the workplace is our motivational levels go up and down, depending on what we're doing, how we're feeling, how we're being treated and so forth. But ultimately, innately, everybody does have a degree of motivation. Just to survive is a degree of motivation. Our job, of course, is to inspire people to be more motivated. But at the end of the day, uh, they, as I said earlier, make that choice. Now, if you question what I'm, if you're sort of doubting what I say there, and you fixate it on somebody that you believe doesn't, isn't really motivated, then consider this. If you've got a body of water that you're living near at the moment, Imagine the circumstance where you took that person out into the water, whether it's a pool or whether it's a, you know, whether it's the ocean or a river, a lake, and uh, you grab them by the scruff of the neck and you push them into the water and held them underwater for a long period of time, you'll find that they're very motivated to come to the surface. So it's just a point I want to make. Obviously, I wouldn't suggest doing that. But what you're doing, of course, uh, is you, uh, what that does is it demonstrates that people do have a level of motivation. To, in this case, it would, of course, be survival. So I think that's a myth to say that not everybody's motivated. Yeah, we're, all, we're all motivated, it's just that we're not always inspired. Now, the third myth, the third myth, is that motivation is a very subjective. 
So what motivate what about what motivates one person may not motivate someone else. So for example, if you were giving extrinsic rewards at work, so for example, a certificate of achievement or you gave someone some free movie tickets because they did a great job on them, they did a great job on a project. Now some people would respond very well to that and some won't. So the reality is that everybody has a different form of motivation. And what that means is that you, so in other words, that one size does not fit all. So, you know, what motivates you may not motivate other people, and very likely that is the case. So what that means in reality is that you've got to listen to people. You've got to get into those conversations that I talked about in Module 3. You've got to find out what makes them tick. Why are they coming to work? What do they want out of their work? Now you might want to, you may not want to directly ask them those questions, although I don't think there's any problem in asking them those questions. But it's important to find out what the underlying motivation is of people. Because once you've found that out, of course, you can use that as a lever to improve or increase their performance or motivation. But just remember that people, for example, that rob banks are, have a motivation. It's not the sort of motivation that gets me up, at, up in the morning bouncing out of bed. But nevertheless, they have a form of motivation. There are people who are motivated by doing things right. There are people who are motivated by prestige. There are people who are motivated by security. And it goes on and on and on. And the key thing for you is to talk to your people and listen to them particularly and find out what it is that motivates them. Another key point about motivation is that intrinsic motivation is more powerful than extrinsic motivation. Now, intrinsic meaning internal. It is really what's within people that is the, is the true motivator, as I mentioned before. That's not to suggest that we shouldn't be giving people rewards and recognition. We definitely should. But understand that if people's motivation is reliant on an external reward or some sort of recognition, then once that reward or recognition can't be given, the person then may not be at the same level of motivation that they once were. So they often say this in recruitment, when you're recruiting someone, it's far better to recruit someone who's intrinsically motivated or has a sense of intrinsic motivation, who perhaps has a low skill level rather than somebody that has a high technical skill level, but a very low intrinsic motivational level. So the important thing is uh, that, again, it is what's within the person that's critically important in terms of motivation. The next point, which is a little bit controversial, I find when I run workshops, people often want to debate this, that money is overestimated as a motivational force. Now, I'm not suggesting for a minute that money's not important. It definitely is. But uh, we often will underestimate it. Uh, it. Money, after all, is just paper and metal. metal. And uh, I'm not suggesting it's not important, of course, but it's not the money that's important, is it? It's what the money can do or will do for a person. And I think sometimes and, and there are plenty of studies on this that show that once we get to a stage of paying people a certain amount, any additional payment or rewards beyond that will not necessarily increase their discretionary effort. So let's not get too hung up about money. Now, obviously, if you stop paying people tomorrow, you would find that they wouldn't be motivated, but, uh, you know, they wouldn't come to work. Uh, obviously, but at the end of the day, money isn't everything. Even though we talk about it incessantly, we think about it all the time, the reality is that money is only one of many motivational forces. Another point is that people are motivated by two key principles, and we call these, and Anthony Robbins calls these, the pain-pleasure principle. In other words, we perceive things in terms of whether it's painful or whether it's pleasurable. And what we tend to do is we remove ourselves from pain wherever possible and move towards pleasure. 
The big difference about that is that we all conceptualize pain and pleasure differently. So for example, two people who are in two separate cars, side by side at a traffic lights, going to the same meeting at work, and, that me and they're late for the meeting. Person in car A is sitting there quietly listening to some music and thinking to themselves, there's nothing I can do about this. Um, I'm late, that's the reality of it, and I'll just uh, listen to some music and off I go. Um, the person in the other car, on the other hand, might be cursing and swearing and carrying on and highly stressed because of the circumstances they're in. They're perceiving this as a very painful experience to be walking into the meeting late. So both of them have the same uh, situation occurring, but both of them are interpreting that situation differently. So we spend our life avoiding pain or doing what we can to avoid pain, and we spend our life seeking out pleasure or what we perceive to be pleasure. So again, what that means for you in practical terms is that you need to understand your people. You need to listen to them. You need to enter into conversations with people and to understand what it is that motivates the people that you lead. Okay. So what I want to move on now to some research that I mentioned early on in the, present, in the presentation, and that is, this is a survey that was done by Harvard a number of years ago, in fact, 2005, but I don't suspect it would have changed much. And these people, 9,000 people were surveyed over a number of continents across many, many industries. And really they were asked a very simple question. Um, what is, a, what is the most important quality that you want in your job, or any job for that matter? So really people were forced to come up with their number one priority about what they were looking for in a job. Now you might find some of these results quite surprising, um, but actually if you think about them, they're not that surprising. Now as I go through these 10 items, I want you to think about two things. I want you to think about your own fulfillment across these 10 things in your current employment. So are all of these 10 things in your employment present or are, those, or, or are there some of these things missing? And the second way I want you to look at this as I'm going through it is to think, as a leader, am I doing whatever I can to try to create the, the environment by which these 10 things are present? Uh, because if you do that, then what you're essentially doing is providing the circumstances or the environment by, where, by which people become motivated. So what do you think number one might be on the list? You might be surprised, and it's a little confronting, but here it is. Number one on the list, as it's coming up on your screen now, is that people said in the survey that they want to work for efficient managers. So if you actually think about it, what people are saying, and this, and how this worked was, this was the majority. So obviously they categorised everybody's responses. And this was the top response. The top response was that people wanted to work for efficient managers. So leadership means a lot. And people want to work for competent leaders. They want to work for people that know what they're doing. They want to work with people that treat them with dignity and respect. And essentially, if you consider the, another, the other nine qualities that people mention, you'll find that if you're working for an efficient manager, it's likely that the other nine will probably be in play anyway. So that's number one. Number two is that people indicated in the survey that they want to be able to think for themselves. Now, you know, that might surprise some of you because you may say, well, I would actually really want my people to think for themselves. And when will they think for themselves? But I think people generally want to have a sense of autonomy in what they're doing. They want to feel that they can make their own decisions. They want to feel that they're not micromanaged, that they have an opportunity to express their own ways and means of going about the work that they do. Number three people have indicated that they 
want to see uh, the end result of their work. So um, what that means, of course, is that people are keen to understand the impact that the work has. Um, now, sometimes that's easy. So think about the industry that you're in. Um, let me give you a, a, an example that uh, really did hit this, really did make this point. I did some work in a local government environment here in Queensland, and I actually went to the outdoor staff and I asked them to rate their level of job satisfaction on a scale of one to 10. 10's high, one's low. And I simply said, how would you rate your current job satisfaction right now? And everyone gave me a score. I collated all of that and uh, we got an aggregate or an average score. I went to the indoor staff and I asked them the same question. So these are people in administrative roles and I asked them how would they rate their current job satisfaction on a scale of one to 10, 10 being high, one being low. I collected all those results and then got an average across the board. What I found very interesting was that there was a significant difference. Who do you think might have had the highest motivational level, outdoor staff or indoor staff? Well, it was the outdoor staff that had the highest job satisfaction. And when I asked people why they had a higher job satisfaction or why they'd rated it as they had, the feedback that I got generally was that people felt that they could see the bridge that they built or they could see the pothole that's been filled or they could see the road that was built. So they could actually see the end result. So what the implications of that are for us as leaders is that we need to link or give people a line of sight between the work that they do and the end result. Now the indoor staff couldn't always you know, make the connection between the report that they were writing and what was happening with that report. So the key thing there is for us to make it very clear as leaders to other people what the end, what the significance is of doing the job right, or if the job's not done right, what the end result will be. So we need to be mindful of that. In some industries, such as the non, not for profit industry, it's a lot easier to do that because people, you would think, uh, have decided to become employed in a not for profit industry because they believe in the cause and they believe in what they're doing and, and, and what, what's actually, uh, what the end result will be. Number four on the list was um, that people wanted to be assigned interesting work. Now, we all know that there's lots of things in organisations that are drudgery, that aren't much fun. And, but we also want to, wherever possible, have interesting assignments and projects to work on, which becomes critically important. So to be assigned interesting work. So I guess the implications for you and me on that one is that we need to be mindful and conscious of how we can help people to take on more interesting tasks, projects, give people some challenges that will stretch them and just basically be mindful of how we allocate and delegate work. Number five on the list was that people felt that they wanted to be informed and there's two types of information that people want in their job which came out of the survey. One of those bits of information is how, uh, how you know, what's the big picture about where the organisation is going. People have a genuine interest mostly in what the organisation is doing in the future and what it intends to do in the future. But they also want to know about their job and what's changing and what, 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 will, what sort of work conditions are changing at the time. So people want to be kept informed and again the implications of this are that we need to be giving people information even if we don't know the answer we probably should be suggesting to people that we don't know the answer but people have a thirst for information. So these sayings about no news is good news or you'll get told on a need to know basis, they really have no place in leadership. We need to be keeping people well informed. Now, number six on the list is that people want to be listened to. Now, um, 
this is interesting because that's why in module three I spend so much time talking about conversations. Because at the end of the day, if you don't listen to people, guess what? They don't listen to you. So it's really, really important that you spend some time listening to people and really listening to people and asking people for their opinions, taking a deep breath and listening and not trying to anticipate what you're going to hear, but just accept where they're at at the time. So people want to be listened to because they're human beings. Number seven on the list, which is coming up on your screen now, is to be respected. People genuinely want to be respected. Now, you don't need to like people, but you, you just have to respect them as fundamental human beings. And this is what I call workplace dignity. It's just really important to give people a chance to perform, to not prejudge people, to uh, give them the opportunity to demonstrate what they're capable of. And now I know that's harder than, than, it, than it sounds because sometimes people really don't warrant respect in your mind. But the reality is if you demonstrate disrespect for people, there is no way that you're going to get that discretionary performance that we're really trying to achieve here. So respecting people is critically important. Number eight on the list is to be recognized for their efforts. So people want to feel that their efforts are being recognized. So they want recognition. They want you to say thank you. They want you to acknowledge the good work that they've done. And I strongly recommend that you do that. And that's why I've really been pushing the idea of giving positive feedback every day, the three, you know, three bits of positive feedback every day. So just say thank you, get used to doing that. Acknowledge the work that people have done. Um, and you will find that that will make a significant difference. Certainly, this is, remember, what people, 9,000 employees have told us that they want in their work. So it's not difficult to do this. It just requires a little bit of discipline on your part to try to recognise the good efforts that go on every day in lots of different ways in your workplace. Number nine on the list is that people want to feel challenged. They want to be stretched, they want to grow and develop. And again, you may think of people that perhaps you've tried to stretch and grow and challenge and it hasn't really worked. But generally speaking, everyone's got a different threshold to the challenges that they're willing to take on, of course. But generally speaking, what people are telling us is that they want to be challenged. They want work that does nourish them in terms of giving them some fulfilment in their challenge. So what can you do as a leader to help people to challenge them to um, you know, take on a new task, try a new activity, go to a new training course, whatever it might be, it's important that you persevere with that. And number 10 on the list is that people want opportunities to increase their skill development. So training and development is a motivational force. We need to continually upgrade and upskill and multi-skill people's uh, competencies. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean just sending people off to training courses. It could well be you coaching them. It could be just simply explaining how something works or even teeing them up with a mentor. Whatever it might be, people want to, want to feel that their skill level is growing and developing. It's a fundamental human need. So there we are, folks. There's the 10 top qualities that employees want in their job. So if you've got any questions or comments or observations, let me know and I will, uh, I'll respond to that in the question box. So the question for you, as I said at the outset of this slide, is how fulfilled are you in your current work? Which of those things are missing on the one hand? And secondly, as a leader, which of those things perhaps could you do more of in order to create the motivational environment for your work workforce to, to give that discretionary performance that we're looking for? All right, moving right along. I want to pose this question to you. Um, if you if you have one person who is just not motivated, 
And I'm sure we've all come across those sort of people. They just don't seem motivated. What do you do? So you've got a person that's not motivated. Where do you start? What's the key thing that you can do? Well, I suggest this. Just ask. Ask them. Just ask them uh, what you can do as a leader to assist them to give the very best in the work that they're doing. Now, you may not get an intelligent answer. You may, you may not. But it's, a, it's courtesy to ask people because sometimes we don't hit the mark with people because we make assumptions about what motivates them or we think that they're motivated by the things that we're motivated by, but that's not necessarily the case. So just talk to them, have a conversation with them. And, uh, you know, if you've got someone who isn't performing well, then have a conversation with them and say, look, I really would like to know what I can do to assist you to give that extra effort in the work that you're doing. Is there something I'm missing? Is there something that you need from me that I'm not giving you? Because I'm happy to do that, but I don't know. So you're going cap in hand to ask people how they might get the best out of you. And, uh, you know, they might give the funny answer like, oh, well, if you paid them more. And then you might just say, well, beyond that, what else could I do? And so you're looking for those key things that perhaps you're not doing. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> So just have the conversation with people. It can make a very big difference uh, in, in what you do. And just down the bottom there, and that's the sort of question that you might ask. Is there anything that I'm doing or not doing that can help or, or isn't helping you to be more engaged in the work that you do? It's a great question for a leader to ask. It shows a genuine interest. It shows a humility. It shows an inquiring mind. It shows a helpful nature. It does a lot of things. So would you be comfortable asking that question? You should be comfortable asking that question because it's a reasonable question to ask. Now, what I want to do now is uh, share with you um, the concept of non-job roles that I've been talking about. And uh, what I want to do here is just map out a model that I've got in one of my books, The End of the Job Description, and just show you um, an approach that you might want to consider. So on the one hand, we've got people's job role. That is what they do technically in the work that they do. Now that job role is normally entailed in the job description. So these are the technical skills and tasks that people are required to do in their work. Now I'm not going to spend much time on that because um, although they're important, there's a dimension of performance that's often missed. And that dimension is the non-job roles that people play or don't play in the workplace. And this has been around for a few years. It's not something, no revelation here, but for 20 odd years, uh, academics, scholars and management thinkers have been thinking very carefully about these non-job roles. And they haven't been able to agree on a uniform framework of non-job roles that are applicable to all industries and all occupations. So I thought I'd take up the challenge in the book and come up with the four non-job roles that I think are key to all occupations, regardless of whether they're skilled or unskilled, highly skilled, professional, non-professional, um, you know, manual versus office-based. I think all of these roles are critically important, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Just before we go any further, I've just got a question or a comment here that I'll deal with. Um, Desiree is asking, uh, are there any more recent studies or research that supports this 2005 Harvard study of these 10 characteristics? Um, there are, Desiree. I don't have them offhand. Um, most of them will say the same thing. They'll be in different orders. Maybe there are a few things that have been increased. There, 
I can say to you for sure that there's, you know, there, there might be some subtle changes across generations, absolutely, because obviously you've got someone starting out new in a job compared with someone who's just about to retire. They will look at things differently, of course. But generally speaking, it's fairly safe to say that those things are applicable. Uh, you mentioned Australian as well. Uh, one of the one of the countries that was surveyed in that review were, was Australia and New Zealand. So it wasn't all Australians and all New Zealanders, but it was a number of countries. So it's a cross-cultural study. Um, but I think, you know, I think my advice to you would be just to Google that. And you might just type in the top 10 things that people want in their job. And I think you'll find there'll be plenty of things that will come up in Google for that. Um, I, I used that survey because I felt that it was quite large, uh, it was cross-cultural and it was also cross-gender and across generation as well. So that's why I used it. But um, I, don't, I don't think actually that there'll be a lot of difference, but you know, I'll let you go and look at that yourself. But um, I think it's fair to say those 10 things are pretty important to most people anyway, whether they acknowledge them or not in a survey. Now, let's go back to non-job roles. So what's one non-job role that's critically important? And one of those is a positive mental attitude and enthusiasm. We actually want people to come to work with a positive frame of mind. Now, I don't necessarily mean bouncing off the walls with great excitement. I don't necessarily believe that's realistic. But I certainly don't want people coming to work who are negative, backbiting, pointing fingers of blame, undermining, all of those things that we know happen every day in our workplaces. So we want people to be reasonably positive and solution focused. I don't think that's an unreasonable request. And if you think about it, we spend a third of our life in the workplace. That's a long, long time. And a long, long time to be negative. So we want people to have a positive attitude. We want people to do that. And, you know, I would strongly urge you to talk to people about that. So, for example, in a team meeting, if a person's made four negative comments during that team meeting and dragged the energy down, I think it's perfectly appropriate for you to pull that person aside at the end of the meeting and let them know that that, that, that was not helpful. Now, they might argue that they were being realistic or whatever, but you need to point out to them that their impact on the other people probably wasn't a value add. So, you you know, um, you have that conversation with people because if you don't talk about these things, then people just automatically assume that having a negative attitude is perfectly okay at work. It's not in my view, and it's a very important part of performance. It's not necessarily embedded in the job description. Another thing we want people to do is we want them to be a team player. These days, of course, we have less hierarchy and we have more cross-functional communication than ever before in our history. So we actually need people to be able to work effectively with other people. That's the reality of it. And, you know, I often hear people say, oh, you know, I'm not a team player. Well, well, become a team player. It's important for you to be a team player. And again, it's important for you to encourage people to be team players because you can have the most brilliant technical person out, but if they're really undermining other people and not able to work with other people in teams, then that's going to be a serious problem in terms of performance. Perhaps we can't quantify it, but it's going to be problematic. So all the good work they might do technically will be undermined by the fact that they're not a team player. We also want people to continually upskill themselves in the workplace. And what I mean by that is that people are continually growing and developing in their work. In fact, they're disadvantaging themselves if they're not, because people who decide not to learn this new computer program or perhaps learn this new system or process or find out more about the product and have greater product knowledge are doing themselves a disservice in terms of their career. So it's actually in their interests to do this. 
So, uh, but it's also in the interests, of course, of the organisation that people will continually upskill themselves. And again, we hear people saying, oh, you know, I'm too old to go to that training program or you should send someone younger. I think that's a big cop out. I think what we've got to do is accept that anybody, regardless of their age, should be growing and developing in their role. And I think your attitude and the conversations you have with people has a great opportunity to reinforce this point. And the fourth area that I think is open for a um, you know, conversation, if you like, is the innovation and continuous improvement role. We actually want people to come to work with their brains. We want people to make suggestions about how things can be done quicker, faster, easier, safer, with better interpersonal cooperation. We want people to come up with suggestions. And we've been struggling with this for 25 years since Peter Senge came up with his concept of the learning organisation. So I, I would have an expectation for people that I manage that they would open their mouth when they've got a, a suggestion about how things can be done more efficiently or effectively. So if you think about it, the things that are on the right hand side, that is the non-job roles that I've shared with you, are critically important to performance, but they're often not embedded in the job description. So I'm sharing that with you because I want you to have conversations about non-job roles and not just talk about the technical requirements of what people do in their work. And certainly it's important to give feedback on that. Now, I just wanted to share with you um, <clears throat> a very reputable theory that uh, I think is stands the test of time. And this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, Abraham Maslow was a psychologist in the early part of the last century. And he came up with the concept that people have fundamental needs that have to be fulfilled in their life. Work does, work fulfills many of these needs, but he's talking about, in a general sense, human beings have a series or a hierarchy of needs that need fulfilling. Now, his argument was that once a need has been met, it's no longer a motivator. So, for example, if you look to the bottom there, you can see survival is a fundamental need that we all have. I think we'd all accept that. So if people feel that their life is in threat, then clearly they're going to do everything they can to avoid the threat of being killed. That's the key, that's the key primary motivator for them. Now, once they're safe, then they need to feel a sense of security. And once they feel a sense of security, and that's both psychological and physical security, they need to feel a sense of belonging. So that's why we have so many groups and clubs and, and organisations in our society is that people want to feel that they belong to something. And once that need has been met, they need, need to feel that their view is, is important, it carries some weight, that people will listen to it, that the leader will take it into account. And if that need's been fulfilled, the highest level of um, the highest level of motivation is what we call, or what Maslow called, self-actualization or self-fulfillment. People want to feel as if they're constantly challenged to grow and develop, develop in their role. So in your role as a leader, according to Maslow, you have three key things to think about. By the time they come to you, hopefully their survival is not threatened and they feel a sense of security because they have a job. So really it's the next three things that are critically important. They want to feel that they're part of a team. They want to feel that their, their opinions count for something. So they want to be listened to, remember previously. And if you can fulfill those needs, then they'll want to stretch and grow and develop. So the argument is if you've got somebody who doesn't want to stretch and grow and develop, it's probably likely that their belonging or prestige needs haven't been met. So it's another framework that you can use to think about the way you might get the very best from the people that work with you. Another theorist came up with the concept of a theory X and theory Y. And a theory X manager is somebody who views um, their workforce or people generally as lazy, they dislike work, 
Uh, they avoid work. If you turn your back, they'll do nothing. They need and want direction and they'll avoid responsibility. Now, if you've ever worked for a Theory X manager, you would know how terrible that is. It's a shocking experience because they don't trust you, uh, they don't believe in you and all the rest of it. What we want you to be, and hopefully you are, is a Theory Y manager. A Theory Y manager sees work as natural, that people will direct themselves if they're given the parameters. People will have a tendency to take responsibility when they need to and they'll be creative and imaginative when they need to be. You will get a much better result as a leader if you're a Theory Y manager, that you adopt a more positive view of human nature. Okay? So, um, of course, this theory has been uh, criticised because it's too simplistic. And there's probably some truth to that, that some of us can be both a Theory X and a Theory Y manager at the same time. But if you have to have a bias, it would definitely be towards a Theory Y manager. Now, the last thing I will say before we finish up is that Peter, um, that Dan Pink in his excellent book, Drive, believed, and he backed this up with some re research, he believed that people fundamentally have three key requirements in the workplace. So what I'd ask you to do is to, and I guess what we're doing out of all of this today is distilling down the all of the work we've done into three key concepts, and they make a lot of sense. He argues that people need to feel a sense of autonomy, people need to feel a sense of mastery, and people need to feel a sense of purpose. What he means by this is that people need to be able to make their own decisions at work, which is the autonomy. So they need, they want and need some freedom to make up their own mind about how things are done, how they might plan their work. This is probably more applicable with knowledge workers than it would be for, say, somebody working in an unskilled or semi-skilled job. People want to feel a sense of mastery, that is, skill development, that they're mastering what they do at work. So what this implies is that we should be providing people with growth and learning opportunities at all costs. And people need to feel a need that the work that they do counts for something. They need to understand and see the line of sight between what they do and the end result. So Pink makes some great points about this. People want to be able to make their own decisions, they want to be able to grow and develop, and they want to be able to understand the value and importance or what um, Simon Sinek calls the why of work, which is the purpose. So we can sum up our session today by giving people freedom to make choice, give them opportunities to grow, and give them a sense of why they're doing what they're doing. All right, so quickly before we finish up, let's sum up. Clarify the task. Show people how they can contribute. Match their job with their personal motivations, wherever possible, of course. Make apparent the personal gains the personal and team productivity. Let people know, acknowledge people's work. Remove organisational blocks, which is very important. Remove supervisory roadblocks, and there are many if we're honest with ourselves. Recognise individual success. Encourage personal goal clarification. Provide regular feedback. All of those things are critically important. So your homework, we just come to the end now. Your homework is to try to use autonomy, mastery and purpose in your leadership decisions and conversations and stick to it no matter what. I want you to take this framework of pinks into your workplace. How can I provide people with more autonomy? How can I help them grow and develop? And how can I explain to them the why of what they do? Now, if you do that, you'll be creating a motivational environment where people may make the decision to give more discretionary effort, in which case you'll improve their performance. So that's pretty much it, guys. Um, thank you for listening in. 
um, as you can see in when we do module five next time, um, I want you to complete a little diagnostic for me and uh, that would be really important uh, because um, I think that uh, uh, what I'll be doing in module five is debriefing you on understanding people and their personality. Just got a comment here. Thanks, Tim. Uh, another good session. I am not able to join session five live, but we'll work through the recordings in the following week. Thanks, Desiree, and thank you for your very good question too. Um, and uh, I encourage the rest of you to ask lots of questions next time around. So thank you, folks. I wish you all the very best and uh, make sure you use autonomy, mastery and purpose between now and the fortnight's time. So thank you and uh, goodbye and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.